Stan Jabalisco here with a continuation of our video tutorial sequence on the book Beginner's Guide to Reading Schematics 3rd Edition published by McGraw-Hill in October of 2013 edited by yours truly Stan Jabalisco previous editions done by Traster and Lisk. Uh, what you're looking at here is figure 5-10 a code practice oscillator. You'll find that on page 96 of the printed book. I recommend the printed book, not the electronic version. The spiral bound printed book, which lays flat on your workbench, has heavy stock paper. A uh, very good uh, uh, little thing to have on your workbench and you don't have to worry about it getting anything more than wet if you spill your Diet Mountain Dew on it. Also it has no battery Requires no boot up, acquires no bugs, nor viruses. So, this is a code practice oscillator found on page 96, and I'd like to describe for you how the signal flows through this thing. If you want to look at all of the videos uh, that I have done in regards to this book, Beginner's Guide to Reading Schematics, go to my website, sciencewriter.net. Click the link videos, it'll take you to my YouTube channel, then hit the playlist called Beginner's Schematics. And I'm in the process of doing videos for this book to describe the flow of currents and signals to supplement the little blurbs in there already called Follow the Flow. Those little Follow the Flow blurbs were requested by you, the readers, for previous editions. Uh, in previous editions, that was some of the reviews requested those, and I added them uh, because I read the reviews, and I read and heed the reviews if, if I can heed them. Some of them are unheedable. I recommend you go and read all the reviews of all my work. Some of them are good for some real laughing uh, fits, and some of them, I guess, are probably good for a few crying fits. But I try my best. And I just keep on trucking, keep on plugging away, and hope that some of you will be happy I do. With that, let's just start at the key and follow the signal through these circuits. You know this is a code practice, or some kind of something to do with the Morse code because of that key. Telegraph key. Follow the flow. The signal goes in here. And now this is an amplifier. This particular uh, PNP transistor amplifies, but rather than taking the output from the collector, we take it from the emitter instead. Uh, that uh, helps with the stability of this circuit. It uh, doesn't provide a heck of a lot of gain. In fact, theoretically, not much at all. But um, it, we don't need a whole lot of gain. We just need enough to cause feedback. So we take the output here, and it goes through this second transistor which amplifies considerably. The output from here does come from the collector and goes through this little network right here. These resistors and capacitors and their values determine the frequency at which this thing is going to oscillate when we close that key. Looks kind of like an upside down T here and a right side up T there. Capacitors and a resistor resistors and capacitors and all these components but particularly the ones inside of this gray shaded box determine the frequency and it's a constant predictable audio frequency and it's a pretty good sounding sine wave so well it's not a pure sine wave but it's a pretty good wave that you can tolerate listening to for long periods of time. What you're going to have to do if you're going to practice the Morse code and learn it, because it takes a lot of practice, if you still want to learn the Morse code. Anymore, the only reason to learn the Morse code is to become a radio ham and use code on the ham bands. <clears throat> it's no longer even a legal requirement to become a radio amateur, but uh, a lot of radio hams still use the code and enjoy it a lot and I am among them. Listen for me, my call sign is W1GV, Whiskey One Golf Victor. You'll find me on the high frequency band, primarily 20 meters. 
14 megahertz, the CW part of the band, that's Morse code. And you will also find me using phase shift keying, PSK, occasionally. Anyway, the signal comes out of this transistor Q2, goes through here. That determines the frequency of oscillation. And then it comes back into Q1 for another round. So it goes from here, out through here, round through here, round through there. Round and around and around. Round and around and around. And that's the way the signal flows through this circuit. The twin T oscillator, as it's called, once again. If I didn't mention it before specifically, the twin T terminology comes from this T and that T. And that's kind of how you can recognize it. But it doesn't really matter what you call it. All you want is for it to work. And that's another thing about this kind of an oscillator. When you close that key, you want that thing to start oscillating. And this circuit is reliable. It will work if you properly choose the component values. These other component values simply determine the biasing on these transistors. So with that, I will close out this little video. And once again, visit me on the web at sciencewriter.net. Uh, you can find all of my uh, vital stats on there and uh, link to my YouTube channel. Go to Beginners Schematics and go to the other ones. Watch the other ones too. Some of them are kind of good for a few laughs. You can find out what an old codger I really am anyway. Stan Jabalisco from the Black Hills of Dakota Territory, United States of America, signing off. Until next time. So long.